Hello there. My name is John Feltz. I am the head of collections and technology at Coastal Carolina University. <clears throat> uh, Coastal Carolina is um, a public four-year institution uh, with an M1 Carnegie classification and just over 10,000 FTEs. Uh, just a little bit about my background. Uh, I've been doing this a while, uh, just over 30 years as an academic librarian, and uh, I've been in technology all of my career, uh, but very adjacent to collections, uh, especially uh, with the advent of all the electronic resources that came to bear starting in the uh, late 90s and the early 2000s. Uh, at Coastal, I took uh, ownership of this collection about two and a half years ago and have been running it since then uh, with a lot of great help. Uh, so, in general, in terms of the collection uh, building strategies that I've implemented, um, uh, generally, I felt like things had been on autopilot for the last decade or so here at Coastal. Uh, we've had a lot of personnel turnover and the like, um, so there was a, a certain inconsistency going on. Uh, and therefore, I knew that we'd need to take a long quantitative and qualitative uh, look at our collections from top to bottom, large and small. Uh, it hadn't been done in quite a while, gosh, if ever here, I mean, you know, comprehensively, uh, but also knew that I needed to work fast, that I needed to be pretty disruptive to our existing way of doing things. Um, because we were behind the curve in so many areas. Um, so we had a decent collection budget, still do for our size. Uh, it's uh, about one and a half million dollars. Uh, and I transitioned to a fully usage based purchasing model for ebooks. I got rid of all approval plans and any sort of speculation uh, around our monographs and uh, both electronic and physical. Um, and instead, I went to a fully usage based modality uh, through DDA and EBA and the like. Uh, and um, we unsubscribed to about 20 relatively high cost, low use databases. I mean, it was a little bit different for me because these are resources that I had seen at very institutions and libraries that I had worked at my uh, entire career. Um, but, you know, if they're just not being utilized, there's not a lot of, and they don't, they're not needed for accreditation. There's just not a lot of reason to keep them around. Um, and uh, I was able to reallocate the majority of that money into transformative agreements and to support open access publishing. So it seemed to me like the time was right on our campus uh, to really embrace open access publishing. Um, we're trying to raise the research profile of the university writ large. Uh, and even though we'd been sort of behind the curve comparatively, comparatively uh, it was a good time for Coastal uh, uh, in that regard. Uh, again, raising the research profile in addition to the uh, Nelson memo, uh, which states that uh, any sort of, um, you know, government funded uh, research must be um, open access as soon as possible and by, if I'm not mistaken, uh, January 1st, 2026 at the latest. So I did a couple of things to support these initiatives. Uh, first, I earmarked $100,000 of our collections money uh, and created an APC fund. Uh, and uh, we will underwrite up to $5,000 per faculty member um, uh, to offset uh, APCs and to support um, open access publishing. And that's not quite as daunting as it sounds. I checked, I did all the math first and looked at the um, open access publishing uh, behavior at Coastal Carolina University and feel relatively confident that we can pull that off. So far, so good anyway, or if we're just relatively new in the semester so far. Um, and also uh, as uh, the second part of this two-pronged approach, uh, I had us pivot hard toward transformative agreements in support of and to uh, support uh, and promote uh, open access publishing at CCU. Um, I started with two transformative agreements at the beginning of the fiscal year 2022-23, and now we have seven. And I didn't have to negotiate a one of them which is the purpose of this presentation, as I understand it, um, uh, is to leverage the power and the uh, expertise of the consortium um, uh, for these types of activities. Um, 
and I could have never negotiated all these deals on my own uh, in the time period stated. Uh, but by again, by leveraging the expertise and negotiating power of Tim Bucknall at uh, University of North Carolina Greensboro and the Carolina Consortium, uh, who has uh, Tim has you know extensive experience and gets great deals for the consortium. So why would I try to reproduce that when he does such a great job already? Um, and I was able to realize cost savings and streamline uh, administrative administrative processes uh, to essentially opt into a transformative read and publish deals. So back to the transformative agreements, I could never have transitioned from two to seven in a year uh, without the collective expertise and bargaining power of the Carolina Consortium. And honestly, I mean, I don't know if I could have negotiated and completely uh, uh, handled uh, one on my own with no help from the library or our legal department at Coastal, which isn't really very knowledgeable about these things. Um, so uh, that's significant. Uh, and, and I feel very fortunate, especially talking to a lot of my colleagues who are not able to leverage uh, consortium arrangements or deals into their uh, collections um, um, development activities. I feel very fortunate that we could do that. And we had such a robust one with the Carolina Consortium. Uh, so some of the obvious benefits are it's cost neutral. I mean, we didn't pay any more to participate in these deals if they just been straight up read deals uh, or just the general subscription model. Um, so we'd have to pay more. Um, and again, we had the shared expertise of leveraging uh, Tim uh, Bucknall and the Carolina Consortium who'd already negotiated these deals for all uh, uh, of the consortium. So I was, and he was always available to answer any questions I had as well. Um, so, uh, and to reiterate the streamlined administrative processes from first vendor contact to going live typically only took a couple of weeks. Um, so with through the Carolina Consortium, we negotiated and joined uh, Wiley, the uh, read and publish deal with an un undercapped underwriting, uh, SAGE, which is 10% off APCs, uh, Oxford University Press, uh, Cambridge, uh, Annual Reviews, which is a uh, subscribe to open uh, uh, model, and then, of course, uh, IGI uh, with the current deal we have in place with the limited APC vouchers. Um, so uh, again, it was uh, uh, a disruptive approach to collection uh, development uh, and an effort to shake things up and to fully underwrite and support as much as we possibly could open access publishing at Coastal Carolina University and to transform us into a fully uh, usage-based model of acquisitions, um, especially in our monographs. And uh, certainly could not have done that uh, without um, um, being a member of the Carolina Consortium. So thank you for your time. Joining us. I'm Larry Treadwell, Director of Library Services. And along with me as part of this presentation representing FSU is Jessica Siri, Head of Public Services. Before I begin and tell you a little bit about FSU and our, our role here, I'd like to thank Mr. John Feltz for his time and patience in working with us on this presentation as it hasn't been easy due to a number of the things happening on our campus and the time that we've had together. FSU was founded in 1867 and like many HBCUs has a rich tradition and history. We are the second oldest institution in the UNC system. And today we serve over 6,500 FTE, a lot of adult learners and a special connection with the military. A little bit about myself. I've been in academia literally my entire life. I grew up building forts out of card catalogs and an academic library. And for some reason I have never left. Uh, I came to FSU in 2021 to assist the university in its SAC COC accreditation and to be part of Daryl House and our chancellor's transformation and trans, uh, project here at Fayetteville State University. Jessica Siri joined me a year later uh, to become my head of public services coming from Wichita State and she brings with her a, a large history of uh, archives and academic library experience. 
So as part of our transformation here, uh, as you will see, collection development was a, a major factor and, and a transformation of not only our collection development, but of our library. You know, we, we had to be disruptive and move quickly, not only due to realignment for SACS, but to move our library forward and to join what other universities were doing. You know, a lot of that transformation moved from access to ownership uh, to expand our access. We had a, a large transformation uh, moving to the digital and online resources, again, part of that, that access uh, versus ownership conversation. And not only were we doing that, but uh, my head of, ac of acquisitions and collection assessment, uh, Ms. Janon Sun, and I were looking at how we can move that collection into uh, a usage-based model. Uh, and part of the, the major reasons for that was to improve our overall offerings, uh, make sure that we provided the resources that our users needed, as well as to get the most out of our budgetary uh, constraints. You know, uh, like many HBCUs, we, we do have budgetary, budgetary constraints. Uh, and, and with that transformation, part of that major transformation was to include support for faculty research. Our budget didn't really allow us to do what Coastal Carolina was doing and have a, uh, an allocation for OA uh, publications for, for faculty. But by moving through and using the expertise of the Carolina Consortium, looking at what our peers were doing and using their expertise, we were able to take advantage of the transformative agreements that were already in existence. And this, this was huge for, for our budget because we didn't have to negotiate those, those transformative agreements. They were already there and, they were, and we were already a member of the Carolina Consortium. And so by joining those transformative agreements and using the expertise of the Carolina Consortium, you know, we were able to offer publication support for our faculty through these transformative agreements. You know, having, having the Carolina Consortia as uh, a resource was critical, especially as we were going through our SAC COC reaccreditation uh, and, and as we were looking to align our resources as, as I worked with Janon Sun and, and Jessica Siri on our collections, you know, we were able to look at what our, our peer institutions had and were using what collections were available and to use Tim Bucknell and the Carolina Consortia to, to align our resources. Uh, Tim Bucknell has already done a lot of the work for us, so that Carolina Consortium resource for us was critical. The expertise was already there for licensing. Um, uh, the negotiations, more or less, were already done, so that, that improved uh, everything for us as well as the user agreements. The, those standard user agreements that have already been negotiated by, by your consortium, by the Carolina Consortium, was, was just amazing to, to us for getting our licensing through, through, through legal. Uh, it, it was a, an amazing uh, benefit for us. I can't say enough about that. And that the portfolio already provided by the Carolina Consortia uh, really allowed us to take advantage of their portfolio and make a, a quick pivot from using, uh, or using usage to align our, our databases and, and to improve our offering. So we, we did a lot of what the Carolina Consortia um, did is we, we cut databases uh, often high high price databases that just weren't being used and and weren't critical and and bring in other offerings that provided greater access uh, at a at, at a savings and and so savings savings in time savings in money 
Uh, also, uh, cost avoidance, one of the, the excellent items that the Carolina Consortium provides us is, is a report on our, our cost avoidance. And we've been able to really take advantage of that and, and use that as part of our conversations with senior leadership here at the, at the university when, when talking about some of the things that we're doing. You know, just, just within the Carolina Consortium, our, our cost avoidance is at, at 8.5 million, which, which is really nice. You know, we've, we've used the Carolina Consortium and their expertise and their platform and, and now we have the seventh most deals within within the consortium membership, which I believe is uh, upwards of 170 different members. So uh, we've really been able to take advantage of that that portfolio and that expertise to to bring things forward. You know, we would never have been able to bring forth the the transformative agreements without the Carolina Consortium. We've gone from zero to Hopefully, for legal is being difficult about one of our one of our offerings, but the the other three transformative agreements went through with without any issues uh, through our legal department. So that expertise to bring those those agreements forward and to present them to faculty has been an amazing win for the the Chestnut Library and and its outreach to to our faculty and. And community um, that that expertise from from Tim Bucknell and and his team over there with the Carolina Consortium has has been just amazing uh, and that's that's our story and we'll be here to answer any questions that you may have for us thank you hello my name is Genevieve Robinson and I'm the managing director of marketing at iJack global I started with the company in 2021 when I made a significant career change from retail management and took a position as an entry-level marketing assistant. During my time here, I've been part of the marketing team and part of the e-collection sales team before being moved back to the marketing team in a leadership role. While on the sales team, I did help to negotiate an agreement with the Orbis Cascade Alliance in the Midwest and Northwest United States, um, as well as a joint collaboration between Orbis Cascade Alliance and the um, Consortium Willa. So we've already heard from two librarians about the benefits and opportunities that they were able to take advantage of due to their membership with a consortium that had negotiated deals with IGI Global on their behalf. But what motivates publishers to offer great deals to consortiums and what do we get out of this? Well, for starters, we get the opportunity to work with libraries that otherwise may not be able to afford an e-collection or open access agreement with us directly. Every institution is different, and while we do reach out personally to librarians, some email systems are set up to only allow safe sender email lists to come through. Uh, while we've been established for 35 years and libraries are mostly aware of IGI Global, having a consortium present our offerings to the library can sometimes be the first time they're seeing our products. We've discovered that trust cannot be built without experience, and we find that once we get the opportunity to work with a library for the first time through a consortium deal, they do remain customers long term. So what are the consortium opportunities that IJ Global's done in the past? And what can you expect your consortium to be able to negotiate with publishers in the future? Well, this is kind of a, a heavy question because there are so many different aspects to it. Um, Ebook collections, individual member discounts is one thing that IJ Global has done with publishers or with uh, consortia where each library member has the opportunity to invest in IGI Global's ebook collections at a discounted rate as a benefit of membership. This ranges from um, 20, 30% off of the e-collections and it's an opt-in typically where they have the choice of which e-collection works best for their institution. Uh, the discount is generally applied evenly across all of our e-collections offerings, our ebook collections offerings, 
And that way, each library has the ability to make sure that the content that they're purchasing makes sense for their institution. We've done title sharing agreements. These are kind of an interesting thing that we've done um, with uh, Carolina Consortium and as well as Orbis Cascade Alliance and Quilla in the past. These are an opt in where multiple libraries get the opportunity to decide if they want to participate in a program by selecting a minimum of one book to purchase at a variable multiplier. Uh, the multiplier is determined by the number of libraries that are participating, and every library gets access to every book selected by the group. So, for example, you could have a total of 10 libraries within a consortium that are participating. Some may have bigger budgets than others, and so the bigger budget libraries obviously are able to spend more and they're able to invest more in the books that they're getting. And that's a benefit to some of the smaller libraries. It's a very equi equitable system, allowing these larger institutions to kind of support their neighbors uh, through the consortium. And that way, any library that purchases at least one book will get access to all of the selected books. And IGI Global does the legwork in making sure that there are no duplication uh, of title selections. Every book that's selected is unique. And if we do happen to get a duplicate request, we do just notify that person, the librarian, hey, would you like to select a different book? This one's already been selected, so if you opt in, you will be getting access to it. So that's been a, a very popular program, and it's a great starting point for working with Consortium that we get the opportunity to get to know a lot of these libraries. Open access agreements. Um, both of the libraries earlier, uh, librarians that you heard from earlier, were mentioning open access um, and how they were able to take advantage of open access through their consortium. There are a variety of different open access agreements. Uh, this can include agreements that are purely for processing charges, as well as those that combine the cost of processing charges with the purchase of content um, with a discounted rate. Uh, if you're going through your consortium, there's a discount applied to these types of agreements. Combination agreements, because every library is different and every consortia is different. The consortia agreements are all needs based and we're excited to get creative to find a solution that works for each consortia. So these are some of the consortia I mentioned earlier, as well as JISC um, that we have worked with in the past. We have others that we're in negotiation with right now. Um, if you don't see your library here, or don't see your library consortium here, let us know. You can reach out to IGI Global. If you want to participate in an agreement with IGI Global, one of the things that we run into sometimes is we will reach out to these consortia and ask if there's any interest in participating with um, IGI Global and putting together a negotiation. And sometimes the response is that they need to hear it from their members. So as the librarian, if this is something that you're interested in, you need to not only reach out to your consortium to let them know what type of agreements you're interested in, but also what publishers you're interested in working with, because they need to know who they should be reaching out to, who should they respond to, because I'm sure that we're not the only publishers reaching out to them about deals. And this is something that they really want to make sure that they're making decisions that are good for their members. And so they need to hear from you. And that is what I have for you today. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions but are not able to join the Q&A coming up shortly, um, you are welcome to send me an email. I have grobinson at igiglobal.com on the screen there. You can also look me up on IGI Global's website. Um, thank you so much again, and we'll see you soon.